everybody welcome back to woodworking wisdom my name's colin way and so nice to be back first of all i just want to let you know what i was doing last week woodworking uh sorry wizardry in wood um it was so lovely being up in london and meeting so many of you up there it's uh, i'm not going to start mentioning names because i'm going to leave loads of people out if i do that but i was just talking to ben a minute ago and it was like a convey about of people coming up and uh, just talking. So it was lovely, like I say, lovely to meet everybody, especially after the year that we've all been through. So thank you so much if you managed to get up there. Myself and Jason had a wonderful time and uh, we can't wait to do it again. So anyway, on with today. And um, if you remember, week before last, I was looking at the Chromacraft range. Really, really excited to be um, working with Chromacraft and doing their products now. They are, are imminent, they're in, they're being put on shelves, they're being photographed and all of those things for you. So we're looking at potentially um, the, the next week and we'll have them ready for you to buy, to snap up. So I'm going to carry on with my my bits and bobs. Um, We've done some uh, use of the stencils a uh, week before last. Now I want to actually make that work on a, uh, a project, on a, on a piece, and we're going to choose a bowl. I think I've got a question here from Ben. Ben's on the cameras, everybody, in the questions. So, yes, Ben, what's the first question? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Everyone's been really helpful in the chat and trying to answer the questions themselves, but it's going to um, a, an extractor, the AC82E. Um, would that work um, for the sanding and, and things on the lathe? Excellent. Who was asking that one? Um, I believe that was Chris. Chris, we did have a quick look before we went live, actually. Chris, yes, no problem that extractor. The extractor on itself just comes with a bag, though. Um, so it's not particularly fine filter bag. So I would recommend you go for a cartridge on that one to make it more um, suitable for sanding dust and turning dust, that sort of thing. So, yes, absolutely, it will do the job. Um, and go for the cartridge just to keep all that dust away from you. So, all right. Uh, okay for the minute, Ben? Excellent. Okay. So yeah, like I was saying, what we're going to do this time, we're going to look at the um, the infill and peel off stencils. We're going to do another butterfly scene like I've done on paper last time, but I'm only going to do a small section. So Ben, can you just go to the bowl just for the minute? This is this is as uh, uh, one that I prepared um, uh, last or week before last, actually. I've just enhanced it this morning. Um, so we're going to do something like this. Now, I, we are going to take this even further. Um, uh, in a few weeks time middle of november i'm gonna um, hook up with someone very very special to me um in a very special place and we're gonna do a, a joint um stream for you where i'm gonna do the turning and the other person is gonna do the embellishment the enhancing so i'm really excited about that so all i wanted to do today was touch on how you can use the stencils um, on a practical piece i don't want to cover up the timber in this case this is a piece of sycamore. It's particularly a nice piece of sycamore. There are a few ripples in it. I just want to show you what you could use the stencils for. Now, this is turning. There will be lots of ex examples of um, using these products, the Chromacraft products, on other pieces. Ben has got so many ideas lined up for you. So um, I just wanted to show you a few now because uh, uh, I'm going to start all of my Christmas decorations coming soon. And while we're talking about that, I will carry on from this stream tonight. I'm going to go straight into uh, the Conkers um, stream for Chestnut, and we're going to do a demonstration there on Christmas carousels and how to make those. So if you're keen to see more um, uh, demonstrations today, 7 o'clock UK time, Conkers for Chestnut um, finishes. We're going to make those uh, Christmas carousels. So come and join us there if you want to. Yes, Ben, we've got another question. Um, so we've got a question here from Mike. Um, he's asking, Colin, what dictates um, the finish you use on different jobs? Um, a lot of the time it's practical reasons. So, for instance, if I'm going to do a salad bowl, I want something food safe. If I want to do a fruit bowl, I want to make sure it's toy safe. Um, if I'm doing something a, like a crafty piece, for instance, I might want to have it particularly shiny. So I go with something like friction polish. Friction polishes will only work up to, work up to a certain size. So once I go past that size onto a, a bigger bowl, but I still want to keep it shiny, I would go something like a sanding sealer and a, a, a wax polish. Want to go even shinier again, maybe an acrylic lacquer. So it's the type of finish that you want and the placement of that finish. A pen, for instance, needs to be hard wearing. So maybe a melamine lacquer. Um, might need to be used. 
So those are the reasons, really. I mean, on some of the nice pieces, um, if I'm texturing, um, again, text when you've te got a textured surface, trying to put a level finish on, so burnish something on, doesn't work. So you have to spray. So those are the reasons, really. Yes. Um, so not so much another question, but there's lots of people in the chat just saying it was really good to meet you last week. Um, and yeah, it was lovely to meet you in person. It was lovely. What a great event as well. It's just, uh, just completely... Uh, full of wood turning and everything about words so amazing work on show as well so it's really a real privilege to be there okay let's crack on and if you missed out but want to go because you've heard lots of good things about it i think it's going to be um three years before the next one normally it's every four years but i think because we missed a year last year because of you know what um i think it's going to be three years time so um fingers crossed that that'll all go ahead as usual Right, just double checking that because I've done that grip up um, about an hour ago just in prep for this. So that's something to bear in mind. If you've left a piece of work on the chuck overnight, make sure it's tight before you start the lathe up the next day. I've had uh, a really nasty uh, black eye because I never done that when I was an apprentice and uh, it reminded me to do so every, every day since then. So tighten the chuck up, make sure it's still nice and sound. So look, what we've got is a nice bit of sycamore. Um, I just want to drop that tool rest down just a little bit and all i'm going to do because i've done the back for us because to do do the whole process and do the spraying would have taken too long so i've done the back i've got a c jaw on the on my sk114 so we've got it nicely um held all i'm going to do is clean the front surface off make the actual bowl shape um, and then we can start doing um some airbrushing dust extractor is definitely going to be needed here um normal circumstances i'd, I'd not only have my full face mask on but i would have ear protectors as well because as soon as you get a bowl of this size, the resonance can be quite extreme. So just think about that. Um, I'm going to do the same as I've done to this bowl, however, and we are going to make it fairly chunky. So just a small bowl in the middle. This will be a feature bowl. So the whole idea is sit in the middle of the table. You can put a few pieces of fruit in the middle, maybe, but then you've got the lovely design on the outside that show, show the bowl off. So talking point, really, more than anything. Yes, Ben, another question. Um, so... Michael would like to know, are Axminster ever going to go back to teaching the one-to-one -one courses? Um, I don't know 100%. At the moment, definitely not um, because of these studios. So um, at the moment, no, we, we won't be. Um, but I don't know what the future holds. And then Martin's asking, um, have you any suggestions of what woods would be best for making cheese boards? Cheese boards go beach as a, as a perfect one um oak is good but just be aware that oak with the tannin the tannic acid in it you know it can react with certain um with vinegar definitely um lemon and all those sorts of things i've got a kitchen table made out of oak um if i um if i put a vinegar pot on it then i'll have a, a, a black or blue uh, ring on that table so it's just those sorts of things to bear in mind but beach is cracking they're really really good um maple's another good one also any of those harder timbers and then Griff's asking, um, are we going to get to see Colwyn with the new robust lathe here soon? You um, are. You are. We've got a webinar coming up next week. Um, so come along to that one. You have to go to our website, look at, look for the webinar news, go to the landing page, um, sign up to it. And then I'll be linking up with uh, Brenton Robust. So we'll be going over to the US. We'll be having a tour around their factory. Um, so, no, that would be a, a, a good one. That's five or oh, six o'clock UK time, but double check on the product page. Um, so go to our website, go to Robust and have a look there. But yes. And Griff's also saying um, he presumes you already tried it. And what, what are your first impressions? I have already tried it. And it's my favorite lathe I've ever used in the world. <laughs> there you go. I can't. I, I'm, I'm a massive fan. I can't rave about it enough. We're going to be putting it on a tour for all of our shops. Um, in January and February. Um, I'm doing two dates. Jason's doing two dates. Helen Bailey's doing, I think she's got three dates. Um, so it's going all, to all of our shops so everybody can see it. They're going to be um, massively publicized. Um, so you can come along, you can have a look and see what it's like for yourself. I've done some big pieces on it and I've done some little pieces on it because I just wanted to get that whole um, vibe about it. I have used it before, um, but it's nice having one here and um, being able to call it our own, even though I can't take it back to my own workshop. And then um, South Poor Shorts would like to know, um, is there any tips on getting a nice curve in the bottom of the bowl? He always seems to get a bump. The bump, the old dreaded gravy bump. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. Um, first of all, I would say don't trust your eyes. So before you look in the bottom, 
turn the lathe off, put your fingers in the in the bottom of the bowl and just glide them back and forward, and you'll pick up those subtle differences. Um, it's the case. What's happening, basically, as you come around the bottom of the bowl, you're swinging the handle, and the handle's continuing, continuing that swing, and so it just dive, sort of diverts from that flat bottom to that little lump. Just keep taking it away. Just keep taking cuts until you can't feel that little lump anymore. It takes a bit of practice when you're, when you're not used to it, but eventually you'll get it, and they will disappear. Don't go the other way, though, and have a little hollow in the bottom. And Vida, I would like to know, um, have you been thinking about doing bottle stoppers? Um, bottle stoppers, um, I do do a lot of bottle stoppers. And um, as much as I, I look at bottle stoppers and anything like that as bread and butter, um, and I do do them, I do do them. They're not my favorite thing because in terms of creativity, they're, they're quite linear, if you know what I mean by that. That, you know, there are certain shapes of bottle stopper that I use all the time. And I think probably because I, I, I've made them in batches of hundreds, um, they, 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 don't, um, they don't spark my imagination, I, I guess. So, yes. I mean, I can certainly show you guys some. Um, not a problem. Not a problem in how we make them. And any tips on finishing them? Finishing them. Uh, bottle stoppers. Again, if you want to go for an immediate finish, go with something like um, uh, friction polish or wood turner's polish, that sort of thing. If you want a really hard-wearing finish, go with um, a melamine lacquer, or even an acrylic lacquer, but a mel melamine's a little bit um, harder again. Um, and the thing is, with, with bottle stoppers, they're going to be handled quite aggressively. They're potentially going to be... Um, I say aggressively only because you want to get them in and get them out. Um, they're potentially going to have wine all over them as well, so you, know, you want a finish that's going to withstand that. So, yeah, I would go for a critical melamine lacquer. Can we get some turning done now? <laughs> okay, so um, I'll just quickly whip through the turning because we've got to sand this up. This Today, the emphasis is on the, 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 the stencils. So there we are. I'm running at 1,000 revs there. I'm not in the firing line. I've got – I'm to one side. And if I want to, of course, I can bring this even further around, so I'm definitely out the way. So it's something to think about. You also watch me start the lathe at zero and turn the lathe speed up. That's that's really important for me. And it's a habit that I've sort of got into. So there we are. So there's our speed. So it's about 1,200 revs. I'm going to start with a 3.8 bowl gouge. I've sharpened these before um, we went live. So let's just do a pull cut first just to take off the uneven surface. And that might look as though I'm being quite aggressive. I'm not. I'm tickling that. It's only a small cut. There we are. So now I'm going to do a push cut. We're just going to get the bevel rubbing. Have a quick look and see where we are. A little bit of a lump there, so I'll get rid of that. And then we'll do the center. There we are. Happy with that. Okay. Now the center. Like we said already, we're not going to make a massive uh, bowl here. This is just a little feature bowl. As long as I get rid of the screw holes.
Let's just stop and have a look. We're going to have a fairly torn surface to start with. I'm going to bring some more light into play, as long as it doesn't bleach too much out. Um, so I've got a little bit of a tear down there. I've got my screw holes I need to get rid of as well. Then we'll stop and have a look, see where those screw holes are. Still a little one there, but I think we're getting there now. I don't want to go too far out either, because don't forget, I want the, the emphasis to be on the, the pictures. So this gravy bump we were talking about earlier, this is where we're going to Make sure that goes. Stop and check for those screw holes. Oh, he's still there. He's been a bit stubborn. Let's get it. another couple of cuts. Now, I'm just going to swap out to a, a sharper bowl gouge. I've just sharpened two for today, just so I don't have to go to the bench grinder. Take your time on this finishing cut. Be nice and slow. Just let the timber come to you. Especially at the centre. You think about surface speed. The centre of your bowl is running much slower than the outside edge. There we are. I'm just feeling for that little gravy bump, as we call it. And he's good. So now we'll start sanding. Any questions before we get into the sanding? Because I'm going to just set the extractor going. All good, Ben? Be good. Excellent. So I'm going to go through the grays. We're going to mix our sanding up now. So I'm going to start with 100 grit. Then I'm going to do a 150, both hand sanding. Then we're going to mix up with some rotary sanding as well. So we're going to crisscross our sanding. Um, and we'll go all the way up to 400 and then on to 600. Um, normally, well, no, I'm going to stop at 400 on this. On the back, I went to 600 because I used a wax finish. If you want to go on to um, a, a, a spray finish, for instance, and especially on for the, for the airbrushing, I want a bit of a key. So I don't want to go ultra glossy. I want to keep some, um, as long as there's no scratches there, I want to keep it sort of satin in finish. Um, it's a bare wood. But afterwards, it doesn't matter. We can spray over it again. We can go lacquer, urethanes, all those sorts of things over the top to seal those, um, those lovely pictures in. But just to start with, we're going to go nice and coarse. And sycamore, we'll talk about sycamore as we start sanding it. Sycamore is one of those problem timbers. It's a little bit like walnut, is it will show a scratch up for a long, long time. So you have to be um, quite resilient with sycamore yourself. It can be quite frustrating timber to work. So that's when I would definitely recommend power sanding or crisscrossing your sanding. Okay, I'm going to turn the lace speed down a little bit just to save my lungs. You know what it's like, I'm talking to you. I don't have my full visor on, but the dust extraction should be taking as much as possible. Normal circumstances, I'd be completely um, covered. Okay, so let's get starting. So dust extraction is going on now. So we're starting off with our 100 and our 150. And the most important grit, we've spoken about this so many times, the most important grit is your 100. 
because that gets rid of all the nasties. So the tears, if there are any, turning lines, if there are any, softening this edge, for instance, all done with 100 grit. And then the subsequent grays just take out the previous sanding marks. Now, your harder area to sand is going to be in here. So if you want to go to power sanding on the inside, then do. In fact, I might even do that in a minute. speed it up for you a little bit. We'll go to a power sanding head. I normally prefer a um, an actual power drill for power sanding as opposed to a cordless drill because cordless drills are just a wee bit too slow. Um, but that's what we're going to use today. Decent grit size knock it up as fast as it can go have a quick look and see where we are it's actually doing a cracking cracking job So I'm going to go now to a 150. Now a 240. There we are, a bit of rotary sanding now. So let's go down to 240 on the rotary. I'm going to turn the lace bit up just a wee bit. And we'll stop and have a quick check. I think a little bit more with the rotary sander needed there. So now we're going to go 400. Two seconds, Ben, I'll be right with you. And you're obviously going to carry on. You're going to keep going until you've got any scratches, any marks out of the way. But this mixing it up with rotary sanding and hand sanding really does help get through those grades quicker and helps get rid of any real deep scratches. So there, that was a 400. 400 on the rotary. And then I'm going to stop. Right, we'll see what we've got. Right, we could do a little bit more in there, but I'm going to stop there. I want to just crack on now with the... I'll do a little bit more on the outside face. 
I do want to crack on a little bit with the actual stencils for you. And don't worry, you think at the end of this it's going to be full of scratches. It won't be because I'll end up coming in in the morning, sanding it all away and redoing it. Yes, Ben, sorry for making you wait so long. Yes. Um, so Jim B would like to know, um, is there a reason why you don't usually sand alternately with the lathe running in reverse? It's not. Hi, Jim, by the way. Um, good meeting you last week again. Um, no, I, I just running reverse just isn't a thing for me. I just don't like doing it because it's the chucks are all threaded on one way. It's, I just don't want the bother of having to secure the, the chucks on the lathe apart from using the thread. Um, I never have. Um, for me, it's just I find it a little bit too much faff, I guess, um, running in reverse you know uh, fixing the chucks on this works and i said so that's why and that's the way i've been brought up as well um to do this this style so that's why i use it all right that doesn't make it right for everybody though i'm just going to put that out there. that's my disclaimer okay there we are i want to wipe off as much of the dust of course because we're going to put a, a color on top normally again if i was in my own workshop dust extraction would be running i'll blow the airline through so we get it nicely finished there we are that's clean enough for what we want if, if i put that down there ben is that going to get in everyone's way no that looks good is that all right yep. yeah yes go for it ben ask, um, ask so away. jennifer would like to know um what what wood is that please this is sycamore this is a lovely bit of i like working in sycamore the grain is it cuts easily as long as you don't wait for it to go too punky you leave it on the ground too long it'll go too soft and it, it can be quite it can tear quite badly but you get it in a good state it really comes off cleanly like maple you know it's the same sort of thing it's a lovely timber if you're gonna enhance embellish any of those things it's like a blank canvas really and the only issue with sycamore and maple is that those scratches do go deep okay so you just got to be a little bit careful of it Right then, so peel off stickers. This is, we are making, what butterfly? We're making a swallow tail. Now this is, um, we're gonna leave this up to the uh, user's interpretation of what a, a, a swallow tail color should look like. This is my interpretation of it. But basically you do whatever color you want. You can go um, uh, absolutely uh, realistic, study pictures of swallow tails. Absolutely, we're, we're just gonna do nice colors, okay? So I'm gonna peel off. I peel off okay and so you get positive and negatives and you can see i've used these before i've used these this morning to do the other pot uh, last week to do the other bowl um and just be a little bit careful when you put it on make sure that it goes on without crinkling and it's designed to come off nice and easy it's not designed to tear grain off your bowl when you bring it off so this here we go so this is going to be the the whole form and we're going to do our nice colors so then we're going to go over it with black then we can peel it off if you wanted to put then shading around it that's where you use the negative image and you actually put then this one the light right you would then put this over the top but peel off this one okay so that's where you where you use them in conjunction with each other or in replace of each other <coughs> excuse me now we're not going to go too crazy with this today i'm going to do two big ones and a and a small one let's put them in strategic places let's go a little bit more random than that that was a bit a bit too even Make sure those edges are down. We want paint. We want a good crisp outside line. And let's go one of the small ones. We'll do him. We'll do it all on one side. So I'm going to put that one up there. Again, flying at a little bit of an angle. 
There you go. Right, once you've done that, we want to mask everything out because we don't want overspray. Whatever happens with an airbrush, you'll end up spraying outside of those square lines. So I'm just going to do a little bit of masking, so bear with me on that one. Whilst I'm doing this, we're going to ask a few more questions. Yes, Ben. Um, so Frederick's saying um, he likes to slightly curve the rim of the bowl, um, not so much to affect the stencils, um, but he finds it feels a little bit better in his hands. Mm, absolutely. It's have a, like a convex curve to the outside. That that will work really well. And then David's asking, um, any idea when the stencils will be available? I'm hoping. It should be around next week. We hope to, to get it out there. Fingers crossed. Like I say, don't quote me on that, but we are hoping to get it out there very, very soon. So like I say, we've got it in. We're just getting it on shelves, getting it photographed, all those normal things that you do. And then Jenny would like to know, roughly how many uses would you get out of one stencil? Well, I've been using this quite a lot since I've had this set, Jenny. Um, I've been playing with it, practicing with it, all those sorts of things, and they're still going strong. These, these three, well, you can see there, I've got in my set, I've still got the the other sheets untouched, okay? So this is the one that I've used so far. And I've done a few of these little platters, um, a fair bit of staff training, so educating all the shop staff and things about what the product is and how it works. And uh, like I say, they're still going strong. I haven't thrown any away yet. So you're going to get quite a few projects out of them. But this is important. You must mask off like any airbrushing project. If you don't, you will get paint everywhere. There we are. Nearly there. You can use normal masking tape if you want to, but I found this frog tape, it's just low attack. And you can go, the green is a fairly good one. The pink tends to go, this is really uh, low tack, this stuff. So if you're really quite worried about damaging either paper um, or, or timber, then go with the pink. But the green seems to work really well on timber. In the middle. Sorry, Ben. So Frederick's asking, um, can you erase the overspray or do you have to turn it off? Um, you, well, you can, but if the overspray, if it's just a little bit of overspray, then a, a very fine abrasive by hand just sand it without anything running, of course. Um, just sand it away. That would be the only way to do it. Otherwise, you, you're you back to square one, sand everything away. All right. There we are. Fairly simple. I'm not going to do too much more than that. Everything's masked. Now I can put colour on. Now, where before I was using the orange, it was really nice. We're going to go blue this time. We're going to go blue and yellow. So a couple of things we're going to do. I'm going to use the, the Chromacraft colours um because it lends itself to this really really well we're going to start with a blue then we're going to go with a yellow to enhance a few areas and of course we've all done our primary colors at school so yellow uh, and blue make green so we've got all that overspray is going to going to mingle in with each other but then we're going to enhance in black as well so um i think that's going to be quite important because you get all the detail and then once we finish that i want to then pick out a few areas in white but we'll do that with a brush and i think that's a real finishing touch that is so we'll start with a blue so we got a teal here i've got my small um compressor down there airbrush compressor we're using the sp50 airbrushes so it's a suction feed airbrush and i'm just going to do not a blanket color i'm not going to go just right the way across i'm going to leave little areas i want to be able to get them enhanced with yellow so i'll use that white just to make sure i'm all good so I'm going to go dark through the middle. And we might even put a little touch of black on there as well, because the body's going to go there, don't forget. And we're going to dark across the top. And practice with your air airbrush. It's quite important that you practice before you start using an airbrush. Otherwise, you'll end up with interesting patterns. Because these are, I wouldn't say they're, um they're uh, sort of hair triggers but the further you pull back on the trigger the more ink you're going to get pumping out and of course if you go back too far you'll get a big splurge like a big spider's web which we don't want so just highlighting the tops 
There we are. Let's go a little bit of a little bit more blue. But you see what I've got there. I've got some lighter areas and some darker areas. The lovely thing about airbrushing is it's all it just fades into each other. There we are. So that's our blue. We'll now go with a yellow. Um, so yellow, and we'll pick out what is essentially white. And then, of course, where it meets the blue, it's going to be nice greens. If we want to... We really want to get... I want some bold colour here, so I'm going quite deep in some of these areas. The beauty of airbrushes, and you've heard me harp on about this so much, the beauty of an airbrush is that the, the, the colours go in on dry, so I can overspray, I can keep going with this um, until I've got the result that I want. So, you know, it's not like using an aerosol, for instance. Now we're going to go to a black. Black. And now I'm going to use my infill stencils. Now this is where your detail comes this is my swallowtail infill stencils. Now you can see there's a couple of options for wing pattern, okay, and size and body and um, antenna and all those sorts of things. So let's, what if I pick one? Let's go with. Yes, that was really pretty. Oh, on there, just match up the lines. There we are, and you can see when I pull that away, the detail. We'll do the same on this one. I'm going to turn them over in a minute. Don't worry, I haven't. We're not doing a one-sided butterfly. I'm using the air to hold that that stencil down. There we are. We've got that lovely detail. Do the same the other side. Same the other side. We've got some really, really nice patterns there. Let's go to, we need a smaller image now. So We are so we've got our lovely decorated butterfly. So next, I'll just put a little bit of black right in the center, just because that's going to just then sort of shade out from the main body. There we are, just to really enhance that body. I think I'm going to just touch up with a bit of blue again as well. Where's that teal? Just to darken the edges here. There we go. Right, so next, that's us done with the actual peel-off stencils so we can peel them off. Get rid of our Infill stencil for the minute. It's always a nice bit. I, I love this bit. It's like unwrapping a Christmas present. I'll keep that bit of paper. We might want to use that in a minute just to mask off other areas. Just a little bit of care. I don't want to rip my peel offs. There we 
we are. And again, just be be a little bit careful. Grab your sheet ready. So the sheet ready to put your, your stencils back on. Whilst I'm doing this, I'm going to answer a couple more questions from Ben. Yes, Ben. Um, so we've got a couple of questions about the stencils. Um, so Gunther would like to know, um, how long do you have to wait before turning the stencil over? Um, instantly. I, I'm straight away. I carry on straight away. Don't wait long at all. And Literally then just use it and then turn it around. And Lawrence would like to know, um, in case you need to, to clean the stencil, um, what product should you use? I'll show you. That's going to come off there. In fact, let me do the body and the antenna, and then I'll clean the stencil. And you can do the same with these peel-offs as well. Um, the peel-offs, leave them flat and wipe them over. But I'm using just, well, I'm using just regular mess. Just pop that down, put that back, let that dry and wipe it off. So in a minute, when I've done the body, I'm going to go, I'll wipe that over and we'll get rid of all that ink. Okay, just with the mess that we've got there. Denatured alcohol I've heard of being used as well. That's on this finish. I mean, that we're talking about this the dyes that I'm using on the stains that I'm using, and it works really well. Look how they ping out now. We're going to enhance those in a minute. I'm going to get some white on there, but we haven't got the bodies or the antennas yet. Yes, Ben. Um, so Frederick would like to know: Does the fresh stain reactivate the stain already on there, um, and therefore run? Uh, no. However, however, you can use. We have a absolutely crystal clear stain from chromacraft so if you use that in between to stop bleeding or um uh, the, uh, some of the urethane um uh, uh sort of clear um covering then that will create your barrier so if you wanted to do i don't know if you for any for instance you wanted to make sure that there was no mixing over you, you could create that clear barrier then and there wouldn't be a problem but no i never uh, you know i'm straight away because it's going on dry it's instantly dry you're you're good to go absolutely good to go all i'm doing on this stencil i'm just um masking off the other areas because i'm going to be spraying quite close to other parts There we are. All I want to use is this middle bit here. You see, just that middle bit. So I've just masked off its surrounding areas. Um, we're going to go black on this one. So my black. And just look to centralize it. We have one body. And again, just taking a little bit of time to get it right in the right place. Yes, Ben. Um, so South Paul would like to know, um, what's the green tape that you're using? Is it just painter's tape? This is yeah, Well, yeah, it is. In fact, it's just what we call frog tape. It was called frog tape. That's a brand name, frog tape. Okay, so that's the small one. We're going to now do one more with the... Sorry, that's the big one we're going to do now. Do one more with the small one. Where is he? Where is he? There he is, right on the end. That's fortunate. Take that little bit of tape off of that bit, gently. Nick my bit of tape from a bit of paper. And then I'm just carefully going to do this one so I don't have to mess around doing too much more masking. And then I just want to do one more thing for you. I'm just going to enhance some of these little areas with some whites. White is a really good color for picking out detail as we've gone over this, obviously, with a dark color. There we 
we go. Beautiful. Right, we'll turn our little compressor off for the minute. We'll put our brush back. I just want to show you about cleaning these off. And I won't bother moving the tape, but you can see here I've got this, this gunky area. Now, the, the um, paint does take a little bit to dry if you put loads on like I have, but not enough to come off on your work. So don't worry about that. But look, if I grab a little bit of my mess now. Just put it on something, a scrap bit of wood or something. Pretty much come straight off. Okay. So it's not nice and easy to clean up. And I'll clean that up properly when we're finished. So there, that's 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 come out quite nice. I'm quite happy with that. But I want to just pick out a little bit more. I want it to be nice and strong. So I'm going to use an acrylic, an acrylic white, any acrylic white, even um, children's paints. You know, that works really, really well. But something with a heavy pigment. I've got an acrylic airbrush paint here. Yes, Ben. Um, so Dances with Aardvarks would like to know, um, is there any solvent to avoid getting it on your stencils? Thinners, I would have thought thinners would probably melt them. Um, but anything like these spirits, denatured alcohol, the, the, the thinners, the um, methylated spirits, that sort of thing, white spirits. I would try, always try a little bit first just to make sure you're not going to ruin your stencil. Um, but um, that's what I've been using. And then Woodwork Learner would like to know, um, does the spirit stain work well with the, um, with the stencils? It does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No problem at all. All right, so just a fine brush. And I'm not going to go crazy with this. I just want to enhance. I don't want to sort of cover anything up. So I'm picking, I'm just going to pick on a few of these. This is not the easiest position to be doing this in. I've done my last one uh, sat at a table. So we're going to uh, make sure that I pick out the same areas on both pieces. And all we're just doing a dab. So don't get yourself the biggest brush in the world. A little bit on the center up here, just a dab on each end. Might want to just this is what I love about this so much. You know, you can be I'm no artist, but you can really make something quite pleasant quite quickly in a very short space of time. And if you've got kids interested, then this is, you know, what a what better project could you have? You will see me pushing this. We've all been asked to do our Christmas stocking fillers. And I think this is one of those really nice things as a gift, because not only does a person get a nice gift but then they get to create things with it as well and i love this and i'm not following any any rules i'm just doing something i like i'm just making a nice series of colors or i think it's a nice series of colors all right not too much more fussing around us we're going to do a couple up here and we're going to call that it And then that's probably time to leave well alone. I'll take that off the lathe just to give it you a better um, look at that. Don't take too much interest of the inside of that bowl because it still needs a little bit of sanding. There we are. So you can just see where those little white areas are that I just picked out. So if you hand enhance them with white it just makes the whole thing pop a little bit 
So like I said, I'm not trying to cover the work up there. Um, I'm trying to enhance the piece. There we are. Turn my other light off, otherwise we won't see it. Let's do that. Get him out of the way. So another a couple of nice looking little bowls. I think we're okay on that main one there, Ben. There we are. So there's today's project. Okay, so that's the Chromacraft infill and peel off stencils. That was the Chromacraft colors that I was using there as well. So nice, vibrant colors. Um, and a huge range of colours as well. Yes, Ben, go for it. So, yeah, we've got a few more questions just come in. Um, Southpaw would like to know, would the stencil stay adhered with the lathe running? Um, probably not, no. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to try it with the lathe running. I'd be a little bit worried about that um, <laughs> because I've spent money on them. But um, uh, I just think they'd peel off a bit too easy because they're that low tack because they don't want to raise the grain of your timber, you see. So they're purposely low tack. So... They'll stay on when you're airbrushing, but not a great velocity, no. And then Maria's asking, um, what could you put over the top and what would smear it? So what do you put? Well, there's a series of, um, of uh, protective coverings. We can go for an acrylic cover. You can go for um, uh, the urethane uh, Chromacraft a sealer to seal it in. Um, but we can also go for the clear lacquer as well. Oh, sorry, the clear... Um, uh, Makes doesn't make sense, but clear stain, clear dye. Um, and I'm going to do more with that in the next few weeks. We're going to look at the, the Viking Sunset Bowl and, and a kit to achieve that. And we're using all of those three um, sealers that I've just mentioned on that. So, um, yeah, so one of those sealers, either acrylic, either a urethane um, or the uh, clear stain. All right. Well, there we are, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed that. That's another one of the Chromacraft. Um, products that I've talked through. Now, next week, it's going to be true Christmas. I'm starting my first Christmas project. And for me, this is the start of, of all the Christmas project. I'm going to have a little interval where we uh, cross over to somebody else where we're going to be playing with these products again. But apart from that, it's all Christmas. So I've got coming up, we've got some little Christmas tree decorations. I've got Christmas carousels, Christmas smokers, and we may even get a chance to do some nutcrackers as well. So like I said, if you want to see more, then tonight I'm, I'll be doing a, a demonstration on Christmas carousels for Chestnut and their Conkers um, stream. Um, I have my own YouTube cha uh, channel uh, hopefully launching this weekend. So there's loads going on for you to see. So join us again next Tuesday. There's, I think, three turning demonstrations next week. So please come back Tuesday, 3 o'clock. And uh, see you again. Thanks for dropping by. Bye-bye.